About a year ago, I was scrolling through eBay and found something amazing. It was a 25-year-old Kawasaki industrial robot arm. I ended up winning the auction, but it was missing one major piece, and that was the teach pendant. When you're buying old industrial robot arms, there's four major things you need in order to get them to work. Number one is make sure it comes with a controller, the correct cabling, the pendant, and a way to power them. Going through some of the Kawasaki manuals, the controller needs single phase 240 volts, which I have 240 volts, although it's the American standard split phase. So I had to buy this 3kVA transformer that turns 240 volt split phase into European single phase to power the controller. Now the pendant. This proved to be a very challenging part to acquire. I ended up paying $1,500 for a refurbished pendant just to get it running. Throughout the course of all of this, I've been in touch with some very smart people from the Robot Forum, which I'll link below, that guided me through every step of installing the new pendant, installing the correct firmware, and troubleshooting to get the robot running again. Upon power up, there was a couple errors that were showing. The first one was the e-stop that was going through the pendant, which I had to plug in yet. But a very common error that comes with starting up old robot arms is the error relating to encoder batteries. There's two sets of batteries on this robot arm. One set of batteries is in the enclosure and the other set is in the base of the robot. And this is so the encoders can remember their position even if the robot is powered off. And typically after about 10 years, these batteries go bad and get replaced. I was lucky enough to find them pretty common on eBay, did a quick swap, and the error was resolved. After changing the encoder batteries, it's typical you have to remaster the robot by lining up all of the joints to their mechanical zero positions and telling the software that they're at zero, and now the robot knows where it's at at all times. For programming, you can do it through the pendant, but I'm used to using terminal software on the computer, which Kawasaki uses KCWIN32 and communicates over RS-232 to the PC port on the controller. In order to get this to my computer, I had to use an RS-232 to USB converter I found on usconverters.com, which is the only converter I found to work with everything. I would definitely suggest buying their ultimate converter listed in the description, because I've never found a case where it doesn't work. So now with the robot up and running again, I can now start a first test project. I want to do more projects related to machine vision and a little bit of AI, so I want to get my feet wet in the water of using this robot arm with machine vision. Only problem is there's no machine vision option that'll work with a machine that's this old, so I need to use a third party option. OpenCV is an old Microsoft library that contains a lot of machine vision algorithms available free to the public, so my setup's going to be a USB web camera that's running on a program I made through Visual Studio that's using the ENGU CV wrapper for OpenCV. Now the only thing left to do is to get my program to talk to the robot controller, which wasn't going to be as straightforward since I'm using a Windows 10 PC that's trying to talk to a 25 year old industrial robot arm controller. Now again, very smart people helped me through this on Robot Forum, which I'll also link below. What I ended up doing is setting up the host comms option on the controller that uses the second port to communicate over RS-232 to my computer. In order to do this, I had to activate the host comms option on the controller, which took some firmware that I'm not allowed to share publicly. In order to test this program, I'm using the free open source program Hercules to test the serial communication, as well as a test program on the controller, and it seems to be working just fine. So the next thing was to get my program to talk to it over serial. This was actually a little easier than I expected. All I had to do was load in the system IO ports library and just communicate through a standard serial port protocol. The first project I want to do is to get the robot to pick and stack pieces of lumber from a moving conveyor belt using a camera. A big challenge here was pulling the lumber off of a moving conveyor belt. Since the valve gripper needs to be on the lumber for about a second for it to actually grip the piece of lumber, the, the robot needs to track the conveyor belt. Typically this is done through a 7th axis that's reading an encoder that's on the conveyor belt. Only my controller didn't come with one. While it has the option to, finding the parts to get this to work is going to be extremely expensive and probably impossible at this point. So I need to get it to work without an encoder. In order to do this, I needed to set a speed value in the PC program of how fast it expects the belt to go, and the rest works by perfect timing. The whole process of finding and picking a board starts out with the camera finding the board, finding the position and the exact time in milliseconds it found that board. Based on the input speed and the pixels to millimeters value, I can predict exactly when the board crosses the pick area. Once the board crosses the pick area, that's when we want the robot to pick the board. Now in the robot controller, I have it set to move to the scent position in one second, which means no matter where the board is at, it will make that move within one second by adjusting the speed value. 
So if my PC program just sends a location value of where the board will be in one second, then the robot arm will perfectly meet the part. Once the robot meets the part, it activates the gripper and then uses a draw function which is typically used in a loading application to follow the part at the inputted speed and then places the part. All this works perfectly if the conveyor is running at a perfect consistent speed, which is never the case. Which is why you see on the pallet all the boards have a decent amount of spacing in between them. That's because that's as close as I could possibly get it without getting an encoder to read the actual speed of the belt. Now there's one big issue you run into when you're using machine vision. That is every camera has its own level of distortion. And that distortion needs to be filtered out or you're going to get inaccurate location values and measurements. This is actually the same issue that Stuff Made Here had when he made his video on a robot that plays pool. Which is a really interesting video you should definitely watch. And in order to get around this you need to filter it out. OpenCV has a function that does this that you need two parameters for. That is a camera matrix and distortion coefficients. You get these from running their calibration routine that I made a separate program for, which consists of running about 50 calibration pictures with a checkerboard pattern in it, and it uses the corners on the, on the checkerboard pattern to find the camera matrix values and the distortion coefficients. And you can then use these values to undistort any other pictures taken with this camera. Here's a rough sketch I put together of the whole system. It's going to consist of two conveyor belts, the first one running slower than the next one, just so the material can space out a bit more, and then run right underneath this USB camera, which we'll see in this field of view. And if the camera sees a rectangle that's this certain size, it'll count it as a board, measure it, and then time the signal to send off to the robot arm that will then pick it and palletize it on this platform. This conveyor would be for mist material that will then go to a bin where it could be refed. This is the robot stand that will support the robot as it's moving. Since I don't have enough concrete to anchor it down, I'll have to build my own stand to support it. It's going to consist of all these leveling feet to make sure that the base is stable no matter the state of the floor and this riser the robot came with to bring it up to a, a working level for the conveyor belts. In order to pick the lumber, uh, I bought a Jolin valve gripper that uses a venturi effect that when I run pressured air through this venturi valve it creates suction through the foam pad on the bottom of the gripper that'll conform to the shape of a piece of lumber. Now I've left out a lot of fine details of this of how the whole system works. If you're more interested in that I'm linking all the CAD and code in the description. It'll all be in my GitHub if you want to take a closer look. And with that all aside, let's start building it.
Thanks for watching, and if you want to see the next project I'm doing with this robot arm, hit the subscribe, and enjoy these clips of me crashing the robot.